involved in urban renewal in local Cold War New York. He has also co-edited a collection of the writings of Jane Jacobs. Today's topic of conversation is his book, The Idealist, which was credited as enormously inventive, using Wilkie's 1942 trip to full effect as a genuinely insightful window into the shape of U.S. internationalism in a moment of sweeping change. It was the winner of the Robert H. Fowle Prize, and in the committee's comments, they noted that the book captured the brief moment between the beginning of decolonization and the arrival of the Cold War. A history of ideas, a social history of diplomacy, and an international history, the idealist was richly researched and written with verb and artfulness. I'd like to give the floor now to Dr. Samuel Zip. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, uh, Drea and Rebecca. I so much uh, have so, so many feelings of appreciation for your interest in this, in this work and in this story, and for inviting uh, me here to speak to all of you. Thank you um, also to uh, everyone behind the scenes for, for making this possible. I'm going to go ahead now and share my screen so that we can see some of the images from this book. Hang on one second. Here we go. All right. All right, there we go. So today, as we've suggested, I'm going to be speaking about some things I learned in researching and writing my new book, The Idealist. Um, I'm going to be doing so with the hope that the story of Wendell Wilkie's world travels during um, the Second World War, uh, his best-selling book, One World of 1943, and his capacious vision of world cooperation might be of some use to all of us during our own times of global crisis. My book is about global affairs, but it's not a policy primer, a study of international affairs, or an analysis of security paradigms. Um, it's very much a story, a narrative account of an idea and a moment in time and their implications for our own lives. And I tell the tale in order to consider a larger dilemma. How should we handle the sense of planetary independence and interdependence brought on by globalization? This is in many ways a lost history or a partially obscured history, we might say. And it's obscured in two ways. First, it's hidden behind a conventional story about Wendell Wilkie, about his significance, when Wendell Wilkie is remembered at all. When we recall him today, we're most likely, or we tend to recall the fact that he was the losing candidate in the 1940 election. Um, and we think about the political events of 1940 and 1941, as the United States was struggling to decide whether to enter the Second World War. Uh, Wilkie is thought of as one of the most famous also rands in US history, working with uh, his rival, Frederick Delano Roosevelt, of course, in a kind of team of rivals model of political leadership. He helped to take the US into World War II, and in doing so, prepared the way for the fabled and now threatened uh, liberal world order established by the rise of US global dominance uh, during and just after World War II. Uh, I wanna suggest, and my, my book really is interested in suggesting that this is not his most important legacy and that it in fact gets Wilkie's ideas about the US role in the world wrong. Um, it gets them somewhat backwards. Thinking of it as the most important story surrounding Wilkie has led to a sort of second act of occlusion here, the forgetting of his most useful and resonant legacy, which is the flawed and much maligned, but still, I think, useful and resonant idea, one world. What I'd like to do today is talk about where the idea of one world came from and to give you a picture of the time when the idea of one world had a particular political and ethical connotation. The use of it identified someone as taking a particular stance in the unfolding debates around global politics and social relations in the middle of this century, or the middle of the last century, actually. But I'd like to, uh, us to think of one world as a kind of usable past, not as a universally applicable ideal outside of time, but as an idea from one time of global crisis that has renewed power to expand our imaginations in our own times. I want to try to show you how Wilkie's journey, his book, and the idea of one world represented or symbolized some of the dilemmas of what we today have offhandedly called globalization, and did so three quarters of a century ago. 
So the phrase one world comes from the title of Wilkie's 1943 bestseller. Uh, he wasn't the first to use the term. Many internationalists with similar ideas had used it in one way or another. But it was his vast popularity and visibility, the quasi-celebrity that he enjoyed during World War II that gave the term the power to signify a kind of whole worldview. My book reveals the larger cultural history of this celebrity, how Wilkie's political fame arose at the heart of what I call the age of broadcasting, a time when media technology had reached its peak moment of mass production and consumption. This is the age of the radio networks, the newswires and syndication services, the newsreels, the weekly picture magazines like Life or Saturday Evening Post, all of which assembled the greatest collective audience for news and information in human history, a time before the media fragmentation that would be unleashed in the wake of the television revolution of the 1950s and 60s, and exacerbated, as we all know, uh, by the rise of the internet in our own recent past. So what was this one world vision? Wilkie announced it in the opening moments of the book. There are no distant points in the world any longer, he wrote. The airplane and a global war had combined, he argued, not only to shrink space, but also to push Americans towards a new understanding of their nation's political responsibilities. All the world's peoples were be being drawn closer together, he said, while the United States in particular was now inescapably enmeshed with the rest of the world. Our thinking in the future, he declared, must be worldwide. Now, these insights were the product of a journey that Wilkie took around the world in the late summer of 1942 to visit the battlefronts. He was ostensibly carrying messages to allied leaders from his former rival, President Roosevelt. Uh, but uh, as Wilkie flew 31,000 miles in 49 days, making stops in the Middle East, the Soviet Union, and China, um, he made this trip his own. Upon his return to New York, 36 million people tuned in to hear his report to the people, broadcast over all the radio networks. One World, which uh, reached about 4 million readers, gave readers an account of that trip and was the culminating act in Wilkie's rise to become a popular icon of global idealism. Now, I tell the full story of that trip in The Idealist. His stops across Africa, the Middle East, Russia, and Asia, in Nigeria, Sudan, Egypt, Turkey, Lebanon, Palestine, Iraq, Iran, the Soviet Union, and China, the people he met in Cairo, in Ankara, in Beirut, in Jerusalem, Baghdad, Tehran, Moscow, and Chongqing, from Charles de Gaulle to Joseph Stalin to Chiang Kai-shek, and a host of other leaders and ordinary people in between. We find him in the book at the battlefronts west of Cairo, east of Moscow, and north of Chongqing. He announces a turning point in, at El Alamein, confronts Euro European empire in the Middle East, the growing conflict between Palestinians and Zionists in Jerusalem, and foreshadows American empire in the region by giving the Shah of Iran his first ride in an airplane. We find him in tense encounters with Stalin and the Chinese nationalists and communists, trying to steer a course between empire and gathering pre-Cold War tensions. Overall, the book suggests that Wilkie discovered a world of insurgent peoples whose desires for freedom did not make it into the headlines and newsreels carrying war news across the globe. He discovered a planet poised between two great world ordering forces, the European empires, British, French, Dutch, that had shaped the globe since the 19th century and before, and the new rising power of the United States, which was struggling with itself to figure out how it would greet, understand, and interact with the world it was poised to dominate in the years after the war. But One World was written in many ways for Americans to try to get them to actually confront the world as it was. And the most important thing for Americans to understand about the world, Wilkie believed, was that it was becoming, quote unquote, one. This was a new geopolitical and emotional reality that Americans had yet to really see and understand, Wilkie believed. In a speech in 1943, not long after the book came out, he said, quote, we can stop thinking of the world today as a geographical map, splotches of color that stand only for nations and national possessions. And instead, 
quote, we can begin to think of the human beings who live within those splotches of color as living also within a larger map that marks a single world. One World featured a map of this transnational single world called Flight of the Gulliver, shown here. Uh, it did away with borders and those splotches of color that signified national collectivity. It showed instead a great blue-green spread of ocean and continents connected only by the vector of Wilkie's voyage. For him, this new universal world space offered a clear political lesson. The peace must be planned on a world basis making real the full global interdependency that he hoped would push Americans to avoid the two threats to future world peace, isolationism on the one hand and empire on the other, both of which he were underpinned, he thought, by what he called narrow nationalism. However, Wilkie brought something else home to Americans as well. In Flight of the, uh, excuse me, if Flight of the Gulliver depicted um, a single world, a one world, it also sort of depicted a, a new kind of world geography. The world was not only becoming one, Wilkie argued, it was being reshaped. Perhaps the most significant fact in the world today, he wrote, is the awakening that is going on in the East. This realization pushed him to challenge Americans to see the demands of the world's colonized peoples. He was, as he wrote in the closing moments of One World, only passing on an invitation which the peoples of the East have given us. Here Wilkie is uh, addressing a crowd in Chongqing, China's wartime capital. And from the Middle East to China, lands under various degrees of current or historic sway to European powers, Wilkie made himself into a vehicle, a kind of medium, not only for the idea of a unified world, but also for the widespread demand that free, the freedom for which the allies fought in the war should be extended unilaterally and without regard for colonialism. Men and women all over the world, he wrote in One World, are on the march, physically, intellectually, and spiritually. Old fears no longer frighten them. They are no longer willing to be Eastern slaves for Western prophets. The big house on the hill, surrounded by mud huts, has lost its awesome charm, he said. For people everywhere, quote, in Africa, in the Middle East, throughout the Arab world, as well as in China and the whole Far East, he wrote, freedom means the orderly but scheduled abolition of the colonial system. Now, Wilkie didn't stop there. He issued a challenge to Americans as well. As he put it, the moral atmosphere in which the white race lives is changing, he said late in One World. It is changing, not only in our attitude toward the people of the Far East, it is changing here at home. The United States, he charged, had long practiced inside our own boundaries something that amounts to race imperialism. Wilkie had been involved in civil rights efforts uh, for several years before his trip, and his progressive views had earned him the support of many African-American uh, voters in the 1940 election, as this image suggests, a campaign flyer from Wilkie's uh, 1940 election that uh, advertises his stances on civil rights issues, including um, employment and uh, the hideous crime of lynching, as he puts it. But it was his trip that really allowed him to see how American ideals of freedom were at stake and could be found wanting. During a war against fascism and militarism, when colonized peoples were making their freedom dreams known, the United States had to look to its own inequities as well. It's becoming increasingly apparent to thoughtful Americans, he said, that we cannot fight the forces and ideals, excuse me, ideas of imperialism abroad and maintain any form of imperialism at home. The war has done this to our thinking. Now, Wilkie was almost alone, with the exception perhaps of Eleanor Roosevelt, um, as a mainstream white political figure with the cultural reach to access literally millions of American homes in labeling domestic segregation as akin to colonialism, a kind of imperialism at home. Overall, Wilkie argued, the fate of the United States uh, rested on challenges that were both within and beyond the nation's borders. Americans had to embrace a sense of reciprocity with the world. Their power and independence in the post-war world, Wilkie argued, would require embracing interdependence with others. 
interdependence with the world was in turn dependent on the independence of subject peoples, as he put it, both at home and abroad. And so American independence, right, its freedom to act in the post-war world, that cherished ideal at the heart of American uh, visions of its political culture, required it to work to end colonialism and racism, both at home and abroad. The way to make certain, he wrote, that we do recover our traditional American way of life with its rising standard of living for all is to create a world in which all men everywhere can be free. So Wilkie's newly interdependent world, his shrinking world, was intended to call into question rather than affirm unquestioned assumptions about American or even Western dominance, the lack of capacity for self-governance in the colonized world or the hierarchies of race undergirding those assumptions. The United States, he argued, was enmeshed in a larger world in which its power relied on the, its efforts to advance the freedom of the peoples of the globe not just the United States' promise that it abstractly stood for that freedom around the world. Now, Wilkie wasn't perfect. He challenged Americans, but he also was not immune to the idea that Americans could fix the world, an illusion that has had devastating effects for many years since World War II, right up to our own time. His worldview depended in many ways on the centrality of the United States. In fact, he thought that one of the things that bound all people together in the new one world uh, was fondness for the United States. Chief amongst these ideas, he wrote, quote, which millions and millions of people hold in common was, quote, the mixture of respect and hope which the world with which the world looks to this country. The United States, he reported, enjoyed an unprecedented, quote, reservoir of goodwill out in the world. Um, so this is a slide that shows, it's from an earlier era of the early 20th century and shows um, the use of this metaphor for of goodwill uh, by you know, American uh, missionary organizations who established radio stations in the, in the Middle East to broadcast both their missionary message and their sense that the United States uh, was the carrier of this uh, goodwill towards um, foreign lands. Now, I use it here just as a, a kind of graphic depiction of this mindset, which Wilkie himself, to some extent, inherited, seeing the United States at the center of this vision. Um, there's quite a bit more to be said about this, and there's much more in the book. Uh, but in the interest of time, I just want to note the way that Wilkie's adoption of the trope of goodwill ran somewhat counter to the sense that he otherwise gave of a world rising up to demand and win its freedom from empire. If, as he said, he intended to bring back to the United States an invitation which the peoples of the East had given us, the logic of goodwill appeared to cut in another direction. By that measure, the United States sat at the heart of the world's expectations. The opportunity and power lay not with those levying demands for freedom, but with Americans, whose store of goodwill was the measure of their benign intentions. The very rhetoric of goodwill that Wilkie deployed suggested that the interdependence he sought could be guaranteed only by the presence and power of the U.S. to protect it. By these lights, then, the flight of the Gulliver um, looks like a map of American world influence, and Wilkie's vision reveals America's supposedly benevolent sway over a unified globe that nonetheless occludes the very presence of American empire and power itself. So I hope I've given you a sense of how Wilkie embodied the dilemmas of global citizenship uh, for, for Americans, particularly at the turn of the century. He popularized this idea of one world, an anti-racist view of the world that hoped to create a more democratic shape for future world order. This vision was attacked as naive and impotent in the face of power politics. Um, and I think that there's something true about that um, attack in some ways. Um, but I think our conventional histories of World War II and its aftermath tend to underplay the fact that Wilkie's one world idea was also a strategic vision. It wasn't just um, a, a sort of pie in the sky idea. And it's one that was broadly popular for a time um, on the liberal left uh, in the United States. He argued that, the, that cooperation with the Soviet Union was necessary to avoid a new global conflict, and that agreement between the US and the USSR, which had to be made and not just assumed, would allow the world to move towards the end of the great scourge of the modern world order, racialized empire, 
and thus give smaller countries a greater role on the world stage and an opportunity for freedom and equitable economic development. And so in many ways, um, my book traces uh, the emergence of that vision across this trip and in the years afterwards. Um, in the book, you can read about how that vision fared during the founding of the United Nations and the coming of the Cold War. In many ways, my book is a history of failure. Um, and I think histories of failure are and sometimes, uh, sometimes the most interesting kinds of histories because they allow us to imagine what has been left undone for our own times. Indeed, what I've hoped to share with you today is how Wilkie's vision reflected not only the ambivalent and charged dilemmas of his own moment, but of the globalized times we all live in today. As I try to show in the conclusion to my book, Wilkie's ideas predicted our own times. Like other internationalists, he suggested the way that some kind of widely shared ethos of worldly connection that went beyond the formal governance and even cooperation of nation states would be necessary to handle the increasingly global challenges of modern life. I imagine we'd all agree that one charismatic man can't save us now. We live in fragmenting, not universalizing times. One world may be a slogan from another era, but there are signs, I think, of hope in our times too, many of which I'm sure you all will be familiar with. Uh, fragmentation, I think, may dislodge old assumptions and open the ground for new kinds of visions to cohere and perhaps take hold. For instance, um, people around the world uh, report increasingly high levels of trust in the United Nations. A recent survey of opinion in 26 countries by the research firm Glocalities found that 47% of those asked had faith in the world body, while only 29% distrusted it. Far better ratings than for the EU, NATO, or their own governments. And just 27% had any trust in the United States, a precipitous fall from the urgent expectations that greeted Wilkie on his world tour in 1942. So where might such faith lead? I'm probably uh, preaching to the converted here, but maybe towards giving the UN General Assembly, Assembly greater leverage over the Security Council, or even expanding and reforming the Security Council altogether to reduce its power over the world body or maybe towards a multilateral world bank based in multiple reserve currencies, not just the US dollar, and dedicated to relieving debt crises across the globe. Wilkie urged Americans to listen to anti-imperial insurgents during World War II. True interdependence now means hearing the voices and demands of those in the global South who stand to lose the most from the further erosion of global cooperation on a warming planet. Of course, Wilkie harbored, as I said, a recalcitrant current of nationalism, too. And this is something I'm sure all of you are quite familiar with, particularly as we all try to figure out how to live together in the wake of the pandemic, the brutal effects of which have been accelerated here in, in this country by a political culture that seems to have largely defaulted to the idea that we, we should all just go it alone. And not surprisingly, only 34% of Americans surveyed in that localities poll trust the United Nations. Many in this country, I think, will be drawn to the idea that Russian and Chinese authoritarianism will go unchecked, unchecked in a world without vigorous uh, US leadership. Globalization, political theorists tell us today, is devolving into weaponized interdependence, uh, the, one of the new buzzwords in IR these days, a state in which actors manipulate their advantages in the supposedly flat network of global relations to gain strategic advantage. Now, there are real threats, of course, but thinking that only America can tame them would be as short-sighted as dismissing one world ideals in 1945. One might easily argue that the US has long practiced a form of weaponized interdependence, bending globalization to its own ends. Now, however, I think American power is headed into the twilight. The last few years have made that clear here at home in many ways. Propping up old notions of American indispensability ensures that we're fighting yesterday's battles. Deeper challenges, I think, unite Russia, China, and the US alike in shared peril. 
Perhaps the greatest legacy of the last 75 years has been the absolute determination of the United States to lead the rest of the capitalist world in the global capture and exploitation of the world's natural resources. And that is, in many ways, the one world we live with today. This is a time of so-called polycrisis, another new buzzword in international relations. The planet is inescapably joined in a web of commodity chains, of petroleum pipelines, of greenhouse gases, and the terror of future zoonotic diseases gone pandemic. As such, I think Wilkie's challenges to Americans three quarters of a century ago remain alive for us today. The United States tried for many years to lead the world. We spend a few years trying to ignore or bully it. When will we choose to live in it, not only on our own terms, but on terms equal to its interdependent and perilous global reality? Thanks, and I'm uh, happy to take questions. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Sandy. Um, I'd like to begin the, the Q&A by, by noting the critique that you mentioned in the book um, that E.B. White gave of um, One World, um, that it was not a very good book, but it was an important book and will take its place on the permanent shelf of this groping, hopeful planet. I'm pleased to say that The Idealist is a very good book and will also take its place on the shelf of this hopeful planet. Um, for those who have not seen, we are taking questions and comments as well through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, so please, we have a couple lined up. Um, use that now. Um, I will take moderator's privilege and ask the first question to, to lead us off. Um, so Sandy, it's about your choice of subject. Some of your other writing, as was noted in your introduction, dealt, for instance, with the legacy of Jane Jacobs, um, for those who don't know, a very important urbanist, a revolutionary activist, and those of us who grew up in Greenwich Village have her to thank for saving our neighborhood um, from the clutches of Robert Moses. Um, so very much a local figure of, of somebody who cared about community, somebody who cared about neighborhood. Pivoting from that to your exploration of Wendell Wilkie, um, one can see parallels and one can also see juxtapositions going from the hyperlocal to the imminently global. And I was wondering if you could reflect a little bit on that choice of subject and that trajectory in your own writing and scholarship. Sure, absolutely. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, and thank you for your kind comments about the book. Um, so Jacobs has been an interesting figure to me for particular issues of New York City history, which is another uh, sort of hat that I wear. Um, one incidental thing to note about Jake uh, about Jane Jacobs, who was a, a also like Wilkie, uh, an interestingly iconoclastic political figure, um, claimed by both the left and the right in many ways, um, and and Wilkie sort of moved from. Uh, from a, a, a sort of liberal position uh, to in, into into um, uh, sort of rapprochement with Republicans, although liberal Republicans of the day, and then increasingly towards the radical left, I would say, although I don't think he fully got there. He was always, as I say, a, a capitalist um, in my book, a capitalist, and, and never um, embraced even the even many of the sort of uh, tenets of the New Deal or some of his socialist critics. Um, Jacobs was interesting because she um, she sort of established a, a, a kind of iconoclastic vision of city uh, politics and city uh, the workings of cities at, 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 from the bottom up. And it's in, uh, one thing to note about Jacobs because they were both in, in uh, uh, sort of iconoclastic figures. She actually worked for Wendell Wilkie during his 1940 campaign in New York City. Um, she was, a, I think, a very low level uh, volunteer. Um, and I think in turn, uh, sort of decided by the end of her uh, time in the Wilkie cam campaign that she might not have liked very w Wendell Wilkie very much, <laughs> which is sort of funny. Uh, Wilkie is, uh, she was notoriously sort of um, a, a sort of a crotchety figure, like somebody who had, was, had very sure of her own opinions and very sure of herself. And I think Wilkie was the same way, but Wilkie was also a, a full of bonhomie. And one of the things I do in the book is to try to trace out his, um, 
his kind of personality. Um, but you know, she she's interesting in that way because she she leads into these these people who sit between our kinds of received political opinions. And Wilkie is similar to that in that the story that I tell in The Idealist kind of throws that all, throws up into the air some of the kind of visions we have of, of, of this period. One of which is the, the kind of um, story that tells the middle of the 20th century as kind of just a march towards the Cold War. Um, a, a story about the US's triumphalism during World War II and its righteousness in confronting uh, the Soviet Union, which I think has some truth to it, but is also um, a kind of fait accompli and a kind of set of, uh, really based in a set of assumptions at this point. The other story, as I've hinted at in what I said today, is a story about the division of the world, not into the two worlds of the Cold War, but into three worlds and into um, a world where there's a non-aligned movement that's attempting to bring about decolonization. Um, we have not really uh, fully, at least in the public sphere, uh, put those two stories together. And Wilkie's story is a way to see them operating together um, in the sense that we can see him traveling to both the Middle East and the Soviet Union and to China in one trip and understanding that strategically he needs to think about um, rapprochement with the Soviet Union uh, under the most guarded terms, although he fluctuates a lot about that, and that's one of the big stories of my book is the way he wrestles with that problem, um, in order to try to bring, uh, to ward off what would later become called the Cold War, so as to try to bring an end to colonialism. Um, and so that's one of the big arcs of the book, and I think it's not a story that we fully understand. So that's sort of iconoclasm. And the other place that this came from, this whole book came from, is just one of my earlier books, which traced the history of urban renewal in, in New York City, in which I have a chapter about the building of the United Nations headquarters complex as a whole, um, and thinking about that as a place in the New York City landscape that symbolized both urban rejuvenation um, and world peace, and, and the way those visions kind of um, came into conflict with one another. And many of the characters uh, who celebrated the arrival of the UN, like E.B. White, who was quite interested in the UN as a place um, and compared it to housing projects and things like that, uh, the same sort of, sort of utopian vision of transforming the world around during World War II. Um, and, and that's where I started thinking about this story. And I started thinking about internationalism as a popular vision through the building of the United Nations and decided that Wilkie's story was one that would be um, an interesting one. Um, so I've always been trying to, trying to look for those iconoclastic visions. I think there's a bit of a tension between Jacobs's localism. Uh, localism. I don't think she would have thought of herself as much of a globalist. In fact, she probably would have been suspicious of globalism in some ways. Um, but an iconoclastic political figure um, caught up in these same kind of mid-century political tumults and helping us to tell new stories about that period. And I think that leads very well into um, the first two questions um, slash comments that we received. Um, uh, as much as Wilkie was a globalist and champion interdependence, we see along kind of the fringes um, of the book, as you mentioned, even including his travel plans, um, some of the encroachment of colonialism. Our first question was, why didn't he visit India? And that is answered in the book. And you've spoken uh, a little bit, I think, about um, uh, yeah, um, uh, some of the tensions, but um, that there were still um, constraints on where he could travel based on the colonialist impulses of our, in this case, ally, um, uh, the United Kingdom. And the second question was, wasn't he Euro, Wilkie Eurocentric and different region, regions have their own way of living and standards vary. So is, is it possible to be a true globalist? Is it possible to be truly attuned? I guess is what both of these are um, gesturing to, one specific and one a more general question. Yeah. Let me start with the first one. I, I think, you know, sure, Wilkie was Eurocentric as much as any white American male who'd grown up in the United States in the Midwest in the uh, in the early part of the 20th century. I'd say he was more of an American nationalist than a Eurocentric, Eurocentric sort of thinker. Um, he's susceptible to all the kinds of habits of thought that shape um, a sort of populist uh, he was a Democrat for many years before he was Republican, sort of dem populist, de uh, small d democracy um, in the early part of the 20th century. Um, he was a, an early advocate of William Jennings Bryan, um, he and his family. And so there's a certain kind of nationalism at work there. Um, 
What happens for Wilkie, though, is I think actually something that destabilizes both that sense of American nationalism and any potential um, sort of easy reversion to a kind of Eurocentricity because of what he what he encounters on this trip. And so part of what the story is, is not about a stable identity as either an American nationalist or as a Eurocentric thinker, because he's essentially the, the legatee or the inheritor of a, a kind of um, white civilizational narrative or settler narrative coming from the from from Europe. It's about a person trying to unsettle their assumptions about that world. And right, we can see this actually in the trajectory of the trip, right, which is forced to avoid Europe and actually forced to put him down in Africa, the Middle East, um, the Soviet Union, of course, and, and China. And it forces him to confront uh, at his in, in his own um, assumptions and his own understandings the linked power of empire and race to shape the world. This is something he already was kind of beginning to understand before he left. He had, as I suggested, quite a few contacts, particularly in the civil rights movement, particularly amongst the NAACP and the head of the NAACP, Walter White, who was an internationalist himself and a critic of European empire. And that brings us to the, to the first question about India. So Wilkie was well aware of the um, centrality of India to the British Empire. One of the big stories of this trip is Wilkie's uh, jostling with the British all across his um, his trip. And it's indicative of a sort of lost history that I think we sometimes forget about the run-up to World War II and World War II in general um, in, in our kind of retroactive uh, sort of enshrining of the quote unquote special relationship between the US and the British is the fact that the US and the British were often at odds and often feeling uh, there was a certain tension between the two uh, great powers. The British were very um, uh, annoyed to see the, the, the US supplanting them as a world power. Um, and they were um, often uh, quite caustic about the US's uh, sort of innocence and ability to claim itself as a great innocent um, inheritor of democracy and freedom around the world. Wilkie was sort of one of those people who went around the world kind of offending the British. One of the great stories in my book, a thread through my book is one of is his kind of testy relationship, both sort of friendship and jocular um, appreciation for Winston Churchill um, and the ways that Churchill can't began to sour on Wilkie um, as Wilkie went around the world and, and sort of mouthed off about, about British empire. Um, and so that that's a kind of emerging tension and Wilkie sort of exemplifies some of both America's suspicion about the British and also America's kind of um, blithe innocence about its own power around the world and its own uh, lack of uh, lack of uh, appreciation for its own its, its own emerging power right the power of the United States military which with, with whom which is what really the um, the kind of backbone of this trip this is how how uh, Wilkie gets around in a, in a US a converted US military plane. Um, and so, you know, there's all kinds of really interesting sort of contretemps that arise between the U.S. and the British, particularly in the in, in the Middle East. Um, but Wilkie wants to go to India, right, because he wants to place before the world stage a kind of contradiction, uh, the contradiction surrounding this. Uh, but he isn't able to. Um, Indian nationalists of various sorts invite Wilkie to come. They send him letters. They try to get him to come. Uh, but this is the one big constraint placed on the trip by Roosevelt. Um, Wilkie makes this trip his own and pushes at the boundaries of what this trip is supposed to be about. It's really supposed to be a kind of uh, sort of rallying cry for the allies, but in many ways Wilkie transforms it into a, a vision of a reordered world. Uh, but this is the one limitation. He's not allowed to go to India. Uh, he cannot um, embarrass the Allied war effort, and, and Roosevelt knows that Wilkie can't keep a keep keep a keep a lid on it, so to speak. And so they they make sure that he doesn't go to Wilkie uh, to, to India, even though he tries um, to get there, and he's uh, in contact with um, some of the Indian nationalists. In later years, Nehru and Gandhi will both find Wilkie's ideas and One World as a book extremely. Um, uh, inspiring. Uh, and in many ways, one world is one of the currents and threads that works its way into that that branch of the non-aligned anti-imperial movement, uh, in part because of how much ins how inspiring they found his uh, account of this journey, despite the fact that he wasn't able to go to India. He got a lot of information about India from the Chinese, from the Chinese nationalists, who we think of as a kind of Cold War, um, uh, a Cold War uh, allies of the United States, right? The, the sort of 
line that leads to our support for Taiwan today, but who were also uh, Chiang Kai-shek and, uh, and his regime for all their corruption and all their um, brutality were also anti-colonial uh, crusaders along with Indian nationalists. And so they had, uh, Chiang Kai-shek and, and, and Madam Chiang Kai-shek had spent a lot of time with Nehru and Gandhi in India and were um, quite a source of, of information for Wilkie about that struggle. So he brought much of that back to the United States, even though he wasn't and into one world, even though uh, he had to be cagey about what he said about India. It's fascinating to think that India was the one uh, no-go zone for, for the Gulliver. We have a set of questions here um, that are hypotheticals about um, what Wilkie would think or do about certain situations that confront the world today. And without asking you to channel your mystic powers of um, exactly reaching into the ether, I'll phrase a couple of them here. Um, one is structural. Um, I'll begin with that, and I'll couple that with one that is a um, more topical um, question. So the first is, you mentioned reducing Security Council power, but isn't an additional problem the paralysis of the Security Council caused by the veto power? The Security Council sometimes fails to act, even when there are mass atrocity crimes going on from crimes in Syria to those in China, i.e. genocide against the Uyghurs, etc., and so I think the question here is, what would the globalized interdependent worldview make of the you know, nation Security Council limitations? Um, and I'm just going to couple that with one more question in the interest of we have several coming in right now um, um, to take one um, hypothetical example um, of what Wilkie would have thought. Would the war in Ukraine be seen as a battle between one world and the stubborn old ways of perceiving the world? Um, you've mentioned in the book and in your presentation, Wilkie's um, deviation away from the Manichaean bipolar version of the world, having been at the UN this week and, and seen kind of how the Ukraine situation is playing out, even where people sit um, from civil society these days, um, I think there is a question of whether or not we're in danger of returning to that Manichaean vision. So please, a lot to unpack there. Yeah, uh, I'll say a bit about uh, Ukraine for a moment. I, I, I will, I will caveat all of this with the, with the, um, with the remark that I am a historian and I am not an expert on Ukraine. I followed it like all the rest of you um, as, as best I can. Um, and also, I also would like to say that this is a funny, another place where um, the links between Wilkie and Jane Jacobs are sort of funny because there is amongst urbanists a kind of St. Jane sort of, um, what would Jane do? What would Jane Jacobs do about this particular problem in one neighborhood somewhere? Um, so I don't, and I have made a, a bunch of um, hay about trying to avoid <laughs> that kind of thinking about Jane Jacobs. And I'd like to avoid that uh, with Wilkie too. I don't want a it would be it would be a lot of W's W W W W D. What would Wendell Wilkie do, right? I think that's a tough one, but I do think that what we can do is think a little bit about what kinds of inspirations Wilkie's thought give us for how we might see the problems that are emerging with Ukraine uh, or in this situation. Um, I, I, again, I, I feel a little. Um, uh, on, on more shaky ground than I'd like to be on this, but I do think that Wilkie's vision of the world would, would probably feel, I think, a bit worried about the way that the, there is not an unquestioned, um, across the world, there's not an unquestioned support for the uh, aggression, excuse me, support for the defense of, of Ukraine, right? This sense that um, many folks and some particular uh, nations in the, in, in the global South feel that it's in their interest to hold back from full support for Ukraine. Um, I think he, you know, we can see that this is a failure of the world that, that Wilkie hoped to, this is a result of the failure of the, of the world that Wilkie hoped to usher in. Um, you know, I, I think Wilkie himself felt very strongly about uh, active defense of the um, of 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 nations that were under attack um, by uh, other larger nations or other imperialist nations. Right? He is uh, best remembered in some ways as the person that uh, 
in, articulated within the Republican Party and not a quote unquote, we should call it non-interventionist, uh, not a non-interventionist, but an interventionist kind of vision about World War II. He was in favor of um, us being ready to get into World War II. Um, he was not quote, a quote unquote isolationist, although that is a unfortunate term, I think, in some ways to understand his, uh, the visions of that period. Um, so I think that with with Ukraine, um, you know, it's it's a tough uh, thing to transplant right to our own time. But um, I think Wilkie would want to figure out how multilateral organizations can um, can rally support for the defense of Ukraine, um, and in 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 formations, global formations that don't just revert only to to something like NATO. Um, when it comes to the Security Council. Uh, I think I'm really going to revert to historians, um, the historian's kind of perspective here, because I'm going to, I want us, I think well, what my book can help us to understand is the many potential alternative visions that sat, um, that sat available to Americans, particularly, and many other people around the world in 1944, in the years, uh, in, excuse me, in the months just before Wilkie died in October of 1944. Uh, and one of those was Wilkie's own vision of um, a council, what he called a council of the United Nations. We will recall, of course, that that term, the United Nations, actually was first coined to talk to uh, signify what we call the allies. Um, and what he said was, we need a full council of the United Nations, not just uh, those uh, you know, great powers who are the primary belligerents in World War II, uh, but those who are lining up behind the United Nations in order to uh, find, them, find the, the measure of freedom uh, that countries like the United States have, have claimed for, uh, for the war. So he said, we need a full council of those um, groups. This is uh, in the months, the, the very unsure months in 1944, where plans for the United Nations are just starting to filter out from the, the, the State Department and from those um, parts of the United States uh, foreign policy establishment that ended up driving the shaping of the United, the United Nations and, and shaping the veto and shaping the Security Council as it came to be. I came to be understood, and the and, and the, the the sort of unequal interdependent relationship between the Security Council and the globe and um, and the Assembly, right? I think this is this is a moment where where Wilkie really called for publicly a more democratic form for the United Nations, and, and I think that uh, is the is the form that, of course, all of you um, would would recognize and have are, are, are quite familiar with from other histories of um, alternative forms and visions for the United Nations that were that were uh, produced during this period, uh, this period of civil society, and that were sort of sidelined by uh, the State Department and its need to, and another part, and, and the Roosevelt administration, and their need to kind of protect a, a sort of, um, what, what Roosevelt called the four horsemen, you know, uh, that created the Security Council. Um, so what's interesting about Wilkie, I think I'll just say, is that he's somebody who was able to you know, many of these things evolved in the kind of space of a kind of elite um, discourse in, in, in organizations that, that reached a small audience. And I think Wilkie was somebody who was able to put this vision before a much bigger audience. And part of what my book tussles with is this way that Wilkie was always tagging, tagging back and forth between trying to sort of build a a kind of emotional infrastructure for this kind of worldview, and to try to to sort of figure out when it was right to really put put plans on the ground. So he would announce kind of uh, vague ideas, mostly about how the world should be reshaped and how some a new organization that was in you know was still in the offing at that point uh, should be uh, should be envisioned. Uh, but he never really was the kind of person who put forth these sort of uh, cut and dried plans, as many nonprofits and many sort of philosophers and many other kinds of folks were doing in that period, hoping to shape the, the vision. I mean, he hoped to be there um, on the ground with influence inside politics to shape that. Uh, unfortunately, he died in October of 1944, just as the world was coming together at Dumbarton Oaks to shape uh, the UN. Uh, Sandy, I think I'd like to, to frame this next question and that you've spoken and written about um, uh, Wilkie 
participating at a time of the age of broadcast and using a bully pulpit to communicate directly to a largely uninformed electorate. Um, one Easter egg in the book that I saw got some traction on Twitter is that in 1943, two out of five Americans still did not know what World War II was about, what the war was for. Yeah. Um, when we think of populists who communicate directly to the public, we often now today have a quite different view. And in fact, I'll plug your latest book, uh, The Derangements of Sovereignty, Trump is, Trumpism and the Dilemmas of Interdependence. Um, in that ilk, one of our questions was, how can one reconcile the trend towards globalism with the increasing reach in Hungary, Poland, the US, for example, towards nationalism, and even more to the point, an increasingly selfish, belligerent, and non-cooperative nationalism? Mm -hmm. Wait, I'm sorry. How can we reconcile what to nationalism? The trend towards glo globalism with the increasing reach toward nationalism with the examples that were given. Right. Um, first, I'll say that um, that the piece that you just referenced about Trumpism is a is an essay that's available um, on the Inter uh, ISS website. It's it's on my um, own personal website under writing samuelzip.com. If you'd like to check it out, my it's an attempt to try to come to grips with this problem. To try to uh, really what it was uh, an attempt to come to grips with is the events of of, of January sixth, twenty twenty one, and what that should help us to think. How, how that event should help us to think about the long history of um, white nationalism in this country and its, um, its supercharged emergence in the last decade because I think of our failure to deal with this world of interdependence that we live in. Um, that's kind of the, 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 the scope of that essay. I, I think it's always true that the United States has... Um, one sort of constant, it's a changing saying, you know, it changes its dimensions, it changes its on its the way that it's expressed. But one thing that's been true for a long period of American history is a complex relationship between America's ability to uh, Americans sense that they are um, need to be a powerful actor on the world stage. Uh, but that they need to do it with very little responsibility for their own actions and their own um, impact on the world stage. And I think this is something that is now really coming home to roost uh, for us as Americans um, with the sort of, as I, as I imagined, as I, as I mentioned uh, at the end of my talk there, the poly crisis, as folks are calling it these days, all the things that the United States is finding itself because of its political culture um, really, really unequipped to handle. And I think this is something that that Wilkie saw in a certain lens in, in the 1940s and hoped to try to break open for us, um, but at the same time could never quite work his way free of this underlying American nationalism that I think has given us a lot uh, a lot of trouble. I think I think this is a kind of generational thing that we're going, that, that perhaps we are now in the beginnings of trying to work our way into and through. And it's probably for younger generations than my own, at least, to really realize some new stance, some new attitude, some new alignment, some new alignment towards this set of, set of problems. Um, I, I wanted to pick up on the thing that you mentioned, Rebecca, the, the one quote, the two out of five Americans didn't know what the world was about. I think that's quite instructive. What that really meant was that two out of five Americans essentially saw the war as something that had been forced upon them. And, you know, that's true at a certain level um, in the sense of we were attacked at Pearl Harbor. Um, on the other hand, there were a lot of um, underlying conditions that pushed the United States as an expansionist um, actor on the world stage in the 1920s and 30s into a global strategic confrontation with the, with particularly with Japan, um, but in some sense with, with the expanding force of what became the, the German empire of the Nazi empire. Um, you know, and so that, I don't think this means that, that somehow World War II was not a just war to be in. Um, it was in some way, in many ways, and Wilkie would have believed that certainly, uh, but that um, Americans never quite were able to confront the war beyond something that they needed to win um, and get home from. Um, and this produced a series of different logics that I explore in the, in, in the book, the way that Americans, 
um, lived the war, uh, the way that they imagined what their relationship th to the war was. And this vision has, I think, really um, metastasized over the course of the 20th century and into our own time with a kind of simplistic story about World War II. And this is one of the things that um, I, mean, I probably will be know of, of no surprise to many people here, um, but that, uh, you know, I like to think of it, and I say this in the book, that we, we've kind of, um, I, I sort of sum it up with uh, the plot of that film, uh, that Steven Spielberg film, Saving Private Ryan from, what, 30 years ago now or something, uh, which is an, an incredible film in some ways, right? It, it was well heralded for its scenes, you know, its realistic battle scenes uh, of the D-Day um, invasion and seen for that as a kind of anti-war film. But in many ways, it's a fable about American nationalism. And, and essentially, the entire arc of the film delivers a story about how D-Day and its horrors and, it, and, and the horrors that we were supposed to feel in those opening moments of the film were all worth it, in some sense, to go save one sort of blonde American farm boy. Um, and that that's what the point of the war was, was simply for us to exercise our own great triumphalism. Um, and this sort of, you know, Cold War produced story, I think, um, has not done us any favors in understanding the true shape of the war and not done us any favors in understanding alternative histories of the war. Um, and Wilkie, I think, is a great way to get into those and into some of the dilemmas of them, not in its an own triumphalist, uh, not in another triumphalist stage, just sort of uh, raise Wilkie up as a kind of hagiographic figure who had all the answers. He was caught in the dilemmas as well. But I think to be able to piece our way out of them and to counter the forms of nationalism that have been produced out of that story we have of World War II, it's good to, to try to be able to tell these alternative stories. So for those of you out there who um, know people who are um, particularly obsessed with World War II stories, Here's a slightly different one. Maybe you can send this book on or buy this book as a present for people in, in your families and in, in your friend group uh, who love World War II stories, but perhaps are a little obsessed with the battles <laughs> and the, the high strategy. This gives you a whole other World War II. And I think it's um, that's one of the things I tried to, tried to do with the book. And that's an excellent reminder that we'll be raffling off several copies of Sandy's book. However, we'll also put in the chat, I'm going to ask my colleague Drea to do that right now, the link where you can buy this for all your family and friends. Um, excellent for, for birthdays and Earth Day and any other UN day that you want to commemorate. Um, Sandy, we have a couple questions and comments that link the book and Wendell Wilkie's legacy to CGS's raison d'etre, which is World Federation. I'm going to begin by reading off um, a comment, and then that segues into a couple of the questions. Um, Citizens for Global Solutions, as you know, is almost as old as Wilkie's book, and it openly and unambiguously advocates transforming the United Nations into a democratic federal world government to provide, among other things, the solution to the problem of war. Is it fair to say that One World, the book, uh, embraces international cooperation, understanding interdependence, but does not, as several other books of that era did, openly and specifically advocate world federation? And I think a related question is whether Wilkie ever worked with any of the emerging world federalist organizations or other like-minded individuals, or was he a lone wolf in his approach? Yes. So that's a great question. Thank you for that. It's a, it gives me a chance to, to, to sort of delineate some of the, the streams and currents of um, political culture during the 1940s, other streams of that. Yeah, um, it is correct to say that um, that Wilkie was a, I guess I would say he was a careful supporter of tendencies towards uh, World Federation he would not have been an overt supporter of it. And this was, I likely think, because he was, he considered himself a player in, in national politics and in Democratic, excuse me, Republican politics and potentially um, new kinds of politics that might emerge from World War II. There's a, um, as a bit of a teaser in my book, there's a whole story about his, um, his, uh, his, attempt with Roosevelt to think about forming a third party um, in the in the in the closing years of World War II um, that that ran aground in various ways and I'll leave it leave it at that but he was always thinking towards those kinds of um, those kinds of moves inside the game of party politics um, and and inside national politics so in some sense um, I think he would have felt that to be an open backer of World Federation, what would be to uh, 
compromised his power to, to move inside regular politics. Um, and I don't, you know, he died, as I said, in October of 1944, and it's hard to know, you know, I think these counterfactuals are tough to bring off, but to know exactly what would have happened had Wilkie lived, um, whether he would have kind of tracked into a more conventional Cold War sort of liberalism, or whether he would have found himself making more common cause with the World Federalists um, and others in the late 40s who, you know, after the atomic bomb had a real uh, moment on the world stage to try to turn, amongst many others, to try to turn back the, the, the drift towards Cold War. I don't know exactly. I think I, you know, the cynic in me would be likely to say he might have tacked more towards the center. Um, it's certainly the case that I would not see Wil Wilkie as a conventional advocate of peace. His entire, and certainly not a pacifist, his entire um, political career while going back to the 1920s was supportive of the League of Nations, uh, was against the Ku Klux Klan, I think is an important thing to say. Um, he was still at the same time, um, you know, again, as I said, um, an interventionist when it came to getting into World War II. Again, whether he would have embraced that form of politics and his, his vision of one world did inspire quite a few um, quite a few of the World Federationists and others who, who advocated for a, a sort of more um, unilateral vision, of, of, well, <laughs> a, a more universal vision of, of multilateral relations and world peace. Um, you, uh, part of what I do in the conclusion is trace the idea of one world as it makes its way through many of these different formations um, from the 40s and 50s up into the 60s and then up into our own time. Um, thank you for that. Um, I think relatedly, we have a question about how Wilkie would deal with spoilers. Um, so mentioning that he's not a pacifist, I think is a good segue into what what would we do um, under a Wilkie worldview, WWWD, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> about spoilers such as the Russian Federation with the uh, crime of aggression or um, environmental crimes uh, that are being perpetrated by um, other spoilers. Um, how do we relate to those situations under his estimation? It's a good question. Um, you know, I think I'll echo what I said a little bit earlier. I, I would imagine that Wilkie would have, would probably have um, a sort of, or, or, or let me, let's put it this way. I, I would think that Wilkie's vision of the world uh, as it stood in 1940 three and 44 would have led towards a program in which um, there could be, he would have hoped for a, uh, a kind of globally cooperative, but aggressive response to those kinds of threats to, uh, to a more democratic world order. Um, I think this, you know, all of you will be even more uh, attuned to the difficulties in these questions than, than even I am. Um, I think that, um, Wilkie himself never had to confront the kinds of complexities of that problem uh, because he died in 1944. And so taking his ideas and leapfrogging them into other um, into other moments, I think is is difficult, but it does ask us to imagine what are the lineaments of a, of a kind of of a democratic world order that would also uh, allow for a sort of, um, robust response by a world community to these kinds of, of challenges. You know, I think it's, you know, as, as you said a little bit earlier, Rebecca, it's looking harder. There are, there's a tendency where it's looking harder and harder these days to imagine that. I mean, it's been hard for quite some time. Um, you know, maybe, I, I think we're still in this, coming out of the pandemic, we're still in this really odd moment of um, fluid openness towards a bunch of different uh, questions and possibilities for that that sort of thing. And I hope that there's some tendency towards a, a form of democratic world cooperation that would allow for this um, robust kind of vision of confronting what you've what you've called spoilers. Um, I'm, I'm thinking also here of uh, of E.B. White, who you also um, in, invoked earlier. Um, E.B. White, uh, for those who don't know, I mean, E.B. White was interestingly a, a, himself a, a sympathizer with world federalist ideas. He wrote a book in 1946 called The Wild Flag, uh, which was a uh, kind of compilation of a bunch of essays that he wrote for The New Yorker and Harper's and other magazines that advocated for world government and were essentially, again, influenced by 
um, the UN and uh, the formation of the UN. This is actually how I came to all this is, is, is White's writing about the UN and his thinking about this problem. And White was quite, um, uh, was quite overt that that what was needed was a kind of global, uh, a globally controlled police force, that there needed to be some kind of police um, action, right? Something that went beyond the peacekeeping, what eventually became the kinds of peacekeeping forces. I mean, of course, he also, I think, was not sure uh, what to, how to quickly to formulate that and was also, um, you know, perhaps uh, he he enjoyed the luxury of writing in places like Harper's and the New Yorker, where he could be somewhat airy and <laughs> and vague about these things. But but again, try to encourage a form of political opinion that would lead towards people believing they needed to cooperate and um, and, and 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 create a democratic framework for these sorts kinds of of, of of forces. We have a couple of questions about Wilkie's interactions with um, peers or counterparts um, or other salient figures of the time. And of course, the book spends a great deal um, uh, uh, of time and effort uh, exploring his relationships. But I'm just going to ask a couple specifics. Um, first, in terms of his interaction with other world leaders, and you mentioned Gandhi and Nehru earlier, of course, uh, Chiang Kai-shek and Madame Chiang Kai-shek were are extensively delved into that relationship, is extensively delved into, into the book, but did these world leaders just listen to him or did he inspire any to action? And maybe if you could give some examples. Okay. And then yeah. domestically, it's also being asked if his legacy would be comparable to that of Rosika Schwimmer, Clarence Streit, Cord Meyer Jr., Gary Davis, or Greenville Clark. And we know if Wilkie was connected to these people, and if so, what was his relationship? And again, please, I think uh, full exegesis is in the book, uh, which we encourage you to buy and explore. Yeah. You could um, start to expand on that. That would be wonderful. Thank you. Sure. Let me start with those last figures. You know, all of whom were um, were were various figures as uh, in the World Federalist Movement in one way or another that we talk about that that we talked about just a moment ago. Most of those people, I don't think Wilkie really knew. Um, he may have known. I think he knew Clarence Strait, but that's as far as I'm. I'm, I know um, he probably uh, ha may have had uh, you know correspondence with some of those figures. Um, he was not really circulating in their world during the time he was alive. Um, I think many of them saw him as something of a sort of Johnny come lately to their kind of cause. Um, although his his commitment to the League of Nations went back way back into the 1920s to when he was a boy or a young a young man. Um, but um, they certainly, many of them, and certainly Gary Davis, um, and I write about this in the book, certainly took up one world uh, as a as a slogan and, and used it in their own estimation, used it in their own vision of trying to spread that, that those set of ideals. Um, I, as I've said, I, you know, Wilkie operated in a kind of different um, milieu, a different kind of layer or strata of, of public opinion than those folks did. He was operating um, in, in, yeah, in in national politics, in the pages of Life magazine, in the pages of the Saturday Evening Post, on the newsreels, right? In some ways, he was operating uh, at a for a much greater audience than any of those folks. But in an, in other ways, um, he didn't command a sort of uh, movement in the way that those folks did. So it's a complex, you know, relationship that he had to that. I, he never wanted, to, as I sort of intimated before, never really wanted to be tied down to that kind of movement. Um, okay, so world leaders. He met many uh, across the course of his journey. I think I mentioned uh, the primary ones are um, de Gaulle. Uh, he met Churchill on an earlier trip we, in 1941 during the uh, Battle of Britain. He was in the UK, and so he knew Churchill from that trip. Um, he didn't encounter Churchill, on, uh, of course, on, on this trip. Um, that we write about here, but he he knew Churchill, and they were uh, jousting across the uh, through through the media across the course of his trip, as I suggested earlier. Um, he met De Gaulle. He met Stalin. He had a, a very long meeting with Stalin. Um, he had many se several meetings with Chiang Kai Shek and a number of um, encounters with Madame Chiang Kai Shek, uh, which is one of the salacious details of this book. Um, uh, always uh, interesting. Uh, I'm not going to get too much into it, but there's always been an rumored to have been a, a, a dalliance between the two of them. I'll let you read about that in the book. Um, I think it's more interesting to understand the impact that 
these figures had on Wilkie in a lot of ways um, than what they what they did because of him. Um, in many ways, what they did for him was to uh, shape up his ver his vision of what he needed to take back to Americans. Many of them, I think, were trying to manipulate Wilkie because they saw him as close to Roosevelt and able to take back messages to Roosevelt. I don't think they fully understood the way that Wilkie operated in a kind of semi-autonomous fashion and was trying to carve out a semi-autonomous um, role for himself. What he did was to take both negative and positive lessons from the, these folks. So I go into great detail on this about his encounter with de Gaulle in Beirut at this time and the way he was quite turned off by de Gaulle's insistence on preserving French rights and power in the Middle East and in particularly in, in, in Beirut and Lebanon and the Lebanon as it was called in those years under French rule. Um, and this really uh, crystallized his sense of the uh, inability of the um, of the the French to imagine a way to back off of their mission civil. I always say this wrong. Mission civil in, in in the Middle East. Um, and so he, in the same visit, he met with quite a few Arab nationalists, uh, and they both Syrian and Lebanese, who were also in tension with one another. Um, and that's a very complex story, um, which is quite fascinating, and I go into in detail in my book. Uh, but they gave him a view of uh, of an entirely different Middle East and, and of an entirely different possibility for these nations. The same is true of the Shah, even though the Shah was um, uh, this is before the Shah was in, in some sense a a, a kind of um, American ally. He was testing out the waters for different allies. And this, I think, um, his relationship to Wilkie, which was one of quite, um, was, was quite an exciting one for him. As I mentioned, it was the first airplane ride in the Shah, apparently later became a quite a devotee of airplanes. Um, so Wilkie led him into this. But this is at a time when U.S.-Iranian relations are quite open, and it's quite not clear what's going to happen. And perhaps Iran can become a kind of ally to the non-aligned movement. Um, so th there's much in the air there. Um, with Stalin, it's quite a, a complex and fascinating uh, dance that the two of them do as Wilkie tries to uh, um, put himself into position to be the kind of person who can convince Stalin to be in more in rapprochement with the United States. And as I said, to try to, to, to align um, the US and the Soviet, Soviet Union in a way that they will not fall into a, a great global conflict and that they will, in some sense, be uh, united to, to try to um, reshape a more multilateral world order. Uh, again, uh, in China, uh, he's quite taken with the nationalists. Many people at the time saw him as sort of duped by the nationalists and their shell game um, there. Uh, I think um, that's part of what happened. But another thing that happened there was his uh, his being quite taken with their vision of uh, what would eventually be the non-aligned vision, the anti-imperial non-aligned vision. And he took from that a way to bring home to Americans the power of that vision. And that's, I think, the most important story of his dalliance with Madame Chiang Kai-shek, um, despite the um, the fact of the Chinese nationalists kind of um, sclerotic regime there and its um, and its its its, its pre precipitous fall towards uh, the loss, the quote unquote, loss of China. He also met um, with Chinese communists and um, got from them a kind of different view of that world. Um, this is at a period when, when uh, the Chinese communists and the nationalists were were sort of supposedly jointly uh, running the country in its war effort against Japan. Um, kind of a, a moment where much was up for grabs as he went across the country in 19, across the country, across the globe in 1942. And that's why the, the story is interesting to see much that would later become calcified and hardened is all up for up for grabs. And he's, he's there in the middle of this trying to push it towards a more interdependent vision. I'm aware that we're coming close to the end of our time. Um, a quick answer, yes, the recording of this presentation and the question and answer discussion will be available online, both on our website and will circulate to everybody who registered to, for the event. Um, I'm going to just read this question rather than reframe it. Was Wilkie aware of the dangers slash potential abuses of interventionism? You made reference to the fact that neocolonialism still exists. Did Wilkie recognize that and recognize that many inter invasions and interventions by global North countries, such as the US of global South countries, are attempts by the former to continue control over the latter? Uh, in the abstract, yes, uh, of course. 
Um, these are somewhat anachronistic terms for Wilkie's time, though. We, I mean, Wilkie is operating at an entirely different moment in the world order. I mean, I guess the way I would put it is the thing that Wilkie's coming to learn and grapple with throughout that he never fully uh, reconciles him to himself to, but he he begins to lay out for his vast audience is the power of American empire, the power of American um, America's coming sway over the globe. Right. So he is, uh, insofar as he is a, a powerful critic of um, French and British empire, um, and of that uh, form of violence and power over what would later become the third world or the global south. Sure. Um, he's less able to sort out a kind of um, critical view of the United States and its its empire, right? Um, I tell the story in the book of his relationship to Puerto Rico. Uh, in Puerto Rico, he, he, he visited Puerto Rico during the trip and had been there uh, previously. He was an advocate of Puerto Rican statehood, but not necessarily Puerto Rican independence. I think it was tough for him to work his way out of a sense that uh, that American designs upon places like Puerto Rico or Hawaii or um, other uh, U.S. colonies um, were benevolent. He was at a moment in the, coming out of the 1930s and 40s where coming out of the 1930s, excuse me, where he sort of assumed that the United States would be giving up its empire, imperial possessions that it had acquired in 1898 in the later 19th century, and would um, would let those go. Um, and would, uh, as it did uh, nominally for the Philippines, um, but did not for Puerto Rico or for Hawaii, um, and so or others. So, um, you know, this was a struggle for Wilkie and struggle for many um, for many uh, like him who were trying to figure out how to understand the role of empire on the world stage. Um, but what I, again, want to stress is that this is, uh, he's one of the most, he's one of the people who brought this struggle um, to the biggest audience it probably had ever seen in American life in those years. Um, it, you know, one could argue that it did very little to put the problem of empire at the front of American consciousness. But um, that's no surprise. It's it has not been at the front of American consciousness. People, Americans are quite were quite and remain quite blind to our own imperial power, right? Even after all the things that everyone in this audience knows so well, and as that question suggests, um, we, we we all would know about the the latter part of the 20th century. But I think Wilkie's vision does give us a set of inspirations for how we begin to think about. Um, telling a story about the 20th century and our own time that might begin to undo our um, assumption that, or any assumptions that others around us might have, that um, that that we bring a benevolent view towards the world, and that, that our interventionism in the world um, always brings with it a kind of um, progress and a vision of of modernization and and benevolent uh, progress. Um, you know, I mean, some people have said uh, things like, well, if we had just followed Wilkie, we never would have had Vietnam and Iraq. Um, and, you know, I don't know if it's quite that simple, but um, I do think that uh, his vision of the world, were it, were, it enable, were it possible to institutionalize it as a, a more active force through some of the, uh, so, uh, the civil society organizations that, that, uh, that um, like Citizens for Global Solutions, had that been um, we'd been able to institutionalize that in the post-war period, perhaps we would have had a better chance to offset those um, those those moments, those those interventions by the United States and and, and others around the world. Um, I'd like to conclude our our discussion on somewhat of a next story note. Um, an invitation for for action. Um, you mentioned how uh, well, Wilkie did not coin the term, one world, it became zeitgeist, it became shorthand, and in fact has descended into what you you say in the book, um, uh, you call, I think, marketing kitsch from the American Airlines slogan to the One World Observatory down the street from my childhood home. Um, question that was framed is, did Wilkie suggest any approaches, strategies, or tactics to move towards one world? Can we um, raise this missive, this um, 
uh, exhortation up from the level of kitsch to the level of action and what strategies and tactics would be important for us to employ today? Oh, the question I always dread. Um, you know, again, I can, I'll take the historians out that um, I look backward, not forward, but, um, but I do think that, um, you know, Wilkie was an interesting figure in that he, and I think I've already sort of said this, he was interested in creating a state of mind. That's really the way he put it at one point. And I talk about that quite a bit in the book. There's this whole uh, idea that he operates in the age of broadcasting. He's trying to, he's trying to win support for an idea. Um, and so he rarely, you'll rarely find Wilkie other than that um, argument for the counts for the counts for a more democratic council of the United Nations, um, putting forth these kind of strategic plans or uh, point by point manifestos or plans for what we might do. I think what he imagined was that the the kinds of conditions that were unleashed by World War II, the felt uh, the felt situation, global situation of interdependence would only spread after the war and would underwrite a, a sense of a needing to do something about this, uh, about the, the world crisis and the fact that the, that the world had dragged itself into two world wars across the, the first half of the 20th, 20th century. Now, we know, of course, that that didn't work and that the pervasive, pervasive power of nationalism um, is, always, is always with us. Um, you know, I don't think we go to people like Wilkie for platforms or for, for um, programs. Uh, we go to them for a sense of understanding what kinds of emergent phenomenon are around us in our time today, right? How can we analogize between the emerging shapes of world connection and interdependence that were at work in World War II um, that are with us today in ways that we all together might take up and try to push forward in new kinds of, of fashions. I mean, I think as I suggested at the end of the world, at the end of my talk, we are not in a kind of moment of unity anymore, right? A moment where it seems like perhaps illusory um, during World War II, that everything was being drawn together in one, you know, unified one world. I think that is um, a, a different, we, we live in a different situation today, right? We live on a sort of a fragmented planet, right? And we need to understand it as a planet, not a world anymore. We need to understand this as uh, something that we live in and amongst and are being acted upon uh, and, and are being acted upon by forces that we can't always control. Um, and that that's something that uh, is, 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 is a kind of counterpoint to Wilkie, but also a uh, a kind of legacy of his of his one world vision. This idea that we live in uh, on a kind of a planet being structured by forces of interdependence that we can't um, always control, but that if we want to work with, we need to find ways to work together. I mean, this is why uh, CGS and other organizations that all of you are part of are necessary, obviously, as we know, necessary parts of the future, as all of you know, have committed your, your effort to. Um, what I hope the Wilkie story can do is help us to imagine ways that we can tell stories about the past uh, that open up new stories for the future, open up new kinds of um, imaginations about what's emergent, what's coming today, um, so that we can we can we can think through how it how it would be to to think about to living. I think I put it in the book how how it might be to. Um, I want to see how I say this so I can say it right. Um, how we can live in the world without needing, I think, to dominate it, right? So it's particularly an important story for the United States too, um, as we've discussed. Um, I think we have to live in, in a world uh, without needing, not only the United States need to dominate it, but us as humans feeling like that we need to, uh, that our main way of occupying the world is, is to turn it to our own ends, to turn it towards growth and modernization and progress, right? I mean, this is an ecological and sustainable, you know, new buzzwords for today, right? For this era, sustainability, things like that, that, um, that imagine new relations to, to the world um, and the planet. And Wilkie, I think, gives us a sense that those are possible, that they're with us now, um, and that moving them forward will take all kinds of efforts uh, 
um, but that may be there for us in a world that that makes them more likely than makes them more um, unlikely, and that that's a longer time frame than we might like, and that we may have time for, um, but that, that 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 are there for us to push on. Sandy, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, I'm sure if you could see our audience and participants, you would have uproarious applause. Unfortunately, it is only me and the couple of thank yous that we've gotten in our chat and Q&A. Um, I think I'd like to end um, with the quote from uh, Wilkie in the book, the world is small and the world is one. This is the guiding mission of CGS. And if you are interested in learning more about our programs, um, an email is in the chat. Um, you can also become a member as indicated in the uh, chat and conversation function. Thank you again to Dr. Samuel Zip and please buy the book. Um, and we will announce the raffle winners shortly. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Rest of your Earth Day. I very much appreciate you all taking time to, to be with us here today. So thank you so much.